All right, thank you. Welcome everyone to this brown bag on uh, electric vehicles and plug-in vehicles and understanding the uptake of those. Uh, my name is Björn Nykvist and I'm a researcher here in Stockholm Environment Institute that's in Stockholm for those listening in from uh, other places. And um, with me today I have the presenter which is uh, Frances Spray from Chalmers University. Uh, she's a researcher <coughs> in this field and uh, uh, we actually share the same background from Chalmers where I was an undergrad and you also a while. Uh, all right? No, same I was a PhD then. A PhD, a PhD student, then? Yeah. yeah, you were a PhD and I was a master student, but we have the same type of background in terms of undergrads. And so we knew each other back 10, 15 years ago, but uh, and now we happen to be both in the area of electric vehicle research. So uh, Francis did a postdoc at Stanford and uh, now back at Chalmers as an associate professor, assistant, assistant professor, sorry. And um, she will give a talk uh, for about half an hour and I'll basically hand the word to you and uh, yeah, mediate questions and pass the mic along later on. But I think we say questions to the end, right? For, but if, I guess there is an opportunity also during from the audience here if you have any pressing questions. All right. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much for me being able to present here. Uh, so, uh, as I said, this is a p uh, presentation about understanding potential plug-in hybrid electric vehicle and battery electric vehicle adoption through car movement data. And it's, I should say that it's a Swedish focus uh, on it, uh, kind of. So the ones that are working, it's not work just with me, we're a group working on these issues at Chalmers. Uh, so besides me, it's also Stian Carlson, who is associate professor, and two PhD students, Niklas Jakobsson and Lars Henrik Björnsson. So they are highly contributing to the results that I'll be presenting today. So what we've done is that we've had, uh, the, or the work, part of the work that we're doing that I'll present here is based on so-called car movement data projects that we have. So we, the idea is that when it comes to plug-in hybrids and battery electric vehicles, how you actually use the vehicle is quite important, both for limited range and economic viability. And so what we did was to start, and especially Stian Carlson started the first work about gathering data of how vehicles are being used today. So car movement data. So the first step was between 2010 and 2012, in which about, it was sent out to about over 700 vehicles, but we have good data from about 500 vehicles in uh, the west side of Sweden. I'll have a little bit more than the representative sample for that and we have GPS logging of how they've moved around for uh, average two months. And moving on we realize that uh, when it comes to battery electric vehicles one important adoption group is households that have two vehicles because then you can address the limited range by having another conventional vehicle in it. So then the idea was, in, in this one here, we, we just logged one vehicle per household. So here was the idea, idea to take both vehicles in the same household and log them. So we had about 100 households and about 60 of them with good data. And then this is an ongoing project that we're working on now in which we have taken these here, the two car households, some of them, and replace one of their conventional vehicles with an EV. And then log them while they're using the EV, both the EV and the conventional vehicle, to be able to see is there a difference in travel pattern between when you have one EV and a conventional vehicle compared to two conventional vehicles. But we've also, we are also performing interviews with these households, both before and after, to be able to see how they perceive having an EV if this adoption has been any kind of problem and uh, what differences they perceive that it is to have an EV versus a conventional vehicle. So just this is the first one um, where we have selected a region of Västra Götalandsregionen for those who are Swedish speaking this area here in Sweden because it is quite representative for Sweden in terms of city size distribution, uh, amount of urban and rural areas, at least uh, maybe not for up here in the north, but yeah, at least for where the majority of the Swedish people live. 
Uh, and all cards were selected that are representative in terms of size, fuel, and location. They're all privately driven, so there are no company cards in here, should be set out. And, uh, and it's one car in a household. So it has, if, if we look at this representation, there's slightly more senior citizens that just happen to be there, but not significantly more. And then we have, the, the vehicles have a higher annual VKT than the average, slightly higher. But the reason for that is also because we chose to have quite new vehicles, so not uh, older than eight years, and they normally drive longer distances. Is it vehicle kilometers? Uh, VKT is vehicle kilometers traveled, so annual VKT, so how much they travel. And normally the average for all of Sweden is taken down because the older the vehicles are, the less they are driven. So we have up to eight years old vehicles. And the reason why we chose that is because we presume that if you have an EV, the driving pattern is going to be more similar to a relatively new car than a car that is over eight years old that is maybe standing most of the time. Uh, so if we look at the different studies, I'm, I'm, I'm going to present uh, a little bit more in depth two of the studies in which we've looked at the data briefly, a third one, and then just go over some preliminary results from the ongoing one. This one here, we look at plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. We use the first data set. And we presume in this one, we wanted to see if you presume in a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle that you would have like, there would be an optimal battery size uh, for, uh, that, that you would have for them. So you, in a plug-in hybrid, you have a, a battery, you have an electric engine, and then you have a conventional uh, engine as well. And so we want to see, okay, but then you, the question arises: optimal battery size based on what? And we started to looking at three different um, optimizations. And one was the total co cost of ownership savings for the users, if you look at that. The other was the maximization of total electric drive fraction. So this we thought was kind of the user perspective, is you would want to optimize total cost of ownership. This we thought was more from a societal perspective. So why do you want plug-in hybrid electric vehicles? Well, you want to because you want to increase the amount of driving on electricity. Uh, and so therefore we thought if you want to maximize this, what would be an optimal battery size? And then we instead looked at, well, if you want to get as many plug-in hybrid vehicles in the market as possible, what would then be the optimal battery size? Which could be from an OEM, like from the car manufacturer's perspectives, or it could be in a more dynamic view is that you want to have many vehicles out in the beginning um, just to get to market stimulate uh, the uptake of it. So before I go into our results, I just want to point out a little bit what differences. So we, we based our, our assumption a little bit on total cost of ownership, like this trade-off of how much more uh, battery capacity can be. Uh, if you add another kilometer, is, can you get the savings replaced by that? But when you look at that, you see normally a lot of these analyses are based on battery price. <coughs> but battery prices will be very, affect very differently depending on how energy prices are. So this is actually just to show, these are actually individually optimized batteries, you should say in this one, because it's another paper in which we looked at that. So not presuming that there's just one battery on the market, but each individual driver has the battery size that is optimal for him or her. And so these are averages. And so, um, you get, if you look at, you optimize there and you have different battery prices, you see that you get a different share of PHEVs depending on if you're in Sweden, Germany, and the US. So this is how, even with the same battery price, the influence of energy prices will have on the total cost of ownership or this, the economic viability of the plug-in hybrids. And so because of that, uh, well, one of the reasons for that, we actually looked and set up marginal electricity distance instead. So as I said, at how much um, putting together some of these parameters, that marginal in, uh, electricity driven per kilometer range and per year. So uh, what is the average distance for which uh, one more kilometer of range is equivalent to the savings 
that you get for that because when you drive on electricity it costs less than driving on fuel and so this is just to show a little bit how it relates to battery prices because people are normally more common looking at battery prices as a economic viability and we see here again the difference between Sweden, Germany and the US but in the, what, what I want to illustrate with this is in the current in the future graphs you'll have this parameter down here and so you'll see as this one gets lower it becomes better economic conditions for plug-in hybrid electric vehicles and so depending on which country is you can you can see what battery price it corresponds to. So if you have this MED of 600, if you're in Germany, well, that's about the battery price maybe of about 700. But if you're in Sweden, yeah, it's not even, you would actually, you are already down at around 500. You're already today, you would have an MED that is much lower. So that is just to relate it to you. So you can understand the next graph, which is actually our results. So here are, are the results from that, in which as you see, so over here it's better, better economic conditions for plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. And if we see here, this is the optimal battery size then. So again, presuming that there is actually one battery size, just one battery size for plug-in hybrids on the home market. Uh, and the, these are the different optimizations that I talked about. So this is total cost of ownership for the users. The black one here is electric drive fraction and this is the number of plug-in hybrids on the roads. So what you see is if you want to optimize for the number of plug-in hybrids on the roads, then small battery sizes are actually bit more optimal. Well, if you instead want to optimize for electric drive fraction, how much share of the total kilometers driven, you should actually go for larger battery sizes. Um, and then we see the effect if you look at, well, of course, then if you look at the share of vehicles, Plug -in, if you optimize for plug-in hybrids, there'll be more of them. But the interesting thing I think here is this, the potential electric drive fraction, in which if you optimize for these, the, having many PHEVs on the road, you get a lower share of electric drive fraction. So there can be a trade-off between those two, that having many uh, plug-in hybrids on the road with small batteries can give a smaller share of electric drive fraction should say one thing about this and that is what we've done one assumption here uh, in, in these results that we've then looked at again to so we have presumed here that there's a small cost in going from what is today a hybrid a conventional hybrid which, which cannot be plugged in to going to a plug-in hybrid and uh, so basically we presume the case of which the, the Toyota Prius which has a hybrid model today and then goes in a plug-in hybrid and basically just adds a bigger, um, a bigger battery to it and doesn't have to do any extra cost com connected with the driveline or increasing capacity so much of the electric engine. Uh, we have another scenario in which we look, presume that this cost is much higher and we, we take it as an example the, the Chevy Volt which there is no equivalent uh, hybrid along the way and which has a much larger ba battery and has much more capacity and the driveline is probably much more investment costs in it and if you add that investment cost then you actually have to have much lower MED costs and much better economic conditions for plug-in hybrids to to come true and then the differences between these scenarios are not so different that's because if you see if you if you shift this curve in this direction you would end up around in this area much more instead. So this is presuming that the extra cost of going from a hybrid to a plug-in hybrid is not that big, much more than the battery cost. Um, so since I know there's not much time, I'll move on and then I guess there'll be questions later. Um, so that was plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. Then we wanted to look instead at battery electric vehicles. And in this case here, we, uh, we wanted to look at this, this idea about multi-car uh, households, and specifically then uh, two-car households. And we wanted to see, is there any difference between first and second car? And in this case, we defined the first car as the car that's actually driven most in the household, and the second car as the one that's driven less. And so the idea is that, first of all, the second car we might, our assumption was that the second car would be uh, more suitable because it's it maybe doesn't drive as long distances so range is not as much of a problem um, 
And but then the question, the, the second question arose. But if that's the case, then maybe it may not be economical to actually shift the second car. In this case, we collaborated with Fraunhofer EC, and besides our data, they had a large German mobility panel in which they, instead of having GPS measurements, they had household survey of individuals' movements and, and vehicles. And this is just a little summary. The first one here is from our data in which we see um, observation periodized mean is 58 days and the maximum 147. Well, they have all seven days. So they only have one week of observations. But just, I don't have any slides with all our, with equations and so on. What they do then, since seven days is such a limited, they fit those seven days to a log normal distribution and use the log normal distribution to be able to, of daily uh, vehicle kilometers travel, to be able to do the analysis. Well, we, in our Swedish data, actually extrapolate to one year from uh, the measurements that we have. So what we see here, this is the Swedish data only. Here is the range of when we presume a certain range and we look at how many driving days are actually fulfilled. So here we are presuming that you could only charge your electric vehicle at night, nowhere, no, nowhere else during the day. And so there what we see is as this blue line here is the share of cars in, in that we have looked that don't that have all driving days fulfilled. So basically, if there's a range of, let's say, 300 kilometers, you go up there, you're slightly close to 70% of all the cars. It fits all their driving that they need to do. These other lines here is if you ex accept that there are some days that need some kind of adaptation. So an average one day per month requiring some kind of adaptation in which you actually drive longer than the range is this light blue line and then you come up to one to two days per month and this is when you start getting per week and more than one per week and uh, so these should actually at this line here sum up to a hundred once you get or not really but almost when you come up to 400 uh, kilometers there's some few uh, some few people that have <laughs> individual days ranging over 400 kilometers um, so that gives some kind of indication of vehicles in general. If we look at this distinction between first car and second car in the two data sets, we, what we wanted to do, we met this in days requiring adaptation. So how many days do you need to have an alternative? And this is a cumulative share of the vehicles. Um, so we see this is all cars here. Uh, and we see this line up here is the second car. So we see that there's a much larger uh, CDF for the second car. So there are many more second cars that uh, have fewer days requiring adaptation compared to the first car, which is down here. Which is an indication that when it comes to driving patterns, the driving patterns of the second car are uh, much better adopted to the limited range of the um, of the electric vehicle. It's just that we have 120 kilometers range. Um, which is kind of based on the actual driving today of, like actual range today of, of like a Nissan Leaf or a, a Golf, even if some of the stated ranges are longer. Um, <coughs> and here's for the German data. The German data is much smoother and that's because they base their calculations on a distribution and an hours on extrapolated data. But the pattern is exactly the same. That when it comes to second cars, a much larger share of them uh, have uh, uh, need fewer days requiring adaptation. So then, as I said, our next question was then, okay, it might, but it might be that they, so they drive shorter distances and they drive less, then maybe it's not economically viable to, to have it as a second car. So we went in and we looked at, uh, we made some conservative <laughs> economic assumptions as I discussed this with Björn who did uh, battery prices. We actually used uh, much more conservative battery prices, but just to give an indication. And, and there we see that, I mean, the share of vehicles uh, that are economically viable is like cars, they, they shift down dramatically, but we see that the same pattern exists there, that the second cars are the ones that are anyway best. 
Uh, and the reason for that, one reason for that uh, should be said is that what we do is for the days that are not fulfilled, we put an extra cost. So we presume that if you want to anyway do that trip, you get an extra cost of like renting a vehicle. So we put up for each day requiring adaptation, it is an extra cost in our total cost of ownership calculations. And that means that since the first cars have more days that require adaptation, the cost goes up for having an electric vehicle, even if they might drive more on electricity. And that goes through that the second car will be better economically. Uh, so what in, in this case here, we have looked at the first and the second car as two independent, um, two independent vehicles. So we have not seen that, we've, we presume that what you drive with your second car, you'll continue driving that, and when you drive with your first, you'll continue driving that. So no shifting in between the cars. Um, so what we, in, our, in our second car measurement, by measuring both vehicles, we could actually see that because if you're going to shift trips, you have to know, be able to do that, that the vehicles are back at the same house. You have to know that it's possible to even to be able to do this. So that's why we again looked at Vestayotan Sigyuna and we looked at those who had two cars. Uh, we wanted to have people that were commuting because that we saw was uh, a potential group for, for better electric vehicles. And as these were the specifications of the cars, so we wouldn't end up with big SUVs in which we thought were not viable to replace anyways from an uh, electric vehicle. Um, and so we, and we wanted both, both drive, two people in the household who were actively driving. So you have this kind of trade-off between the two. So this is still under analysis. It's mainly Stian Carlson who is working with, with this project. But I just wanted to do it. So these are, the results here are, this is if you replace the second car, how many fleet average annual, how much you would drive on electricity. Uh, here's if you replace the first car, and here is if you optimize between the two vehicles. So you shift and the one so that uh, you try to uh, replace the vehicle that is best suited for an EV on, on that trip. Um, and so as we see, there's a huge potential of actually increasing the number of electric miles if you optimize here. And they're also making it more profitable for it, but also having a better environmental impact. And it should be said why the second car here is lower is compared to in, in our previous result is because here we have kilometers traveled. So the, they do travel shorter distances and that's why they re replace fewer miles if you shift them to it. Um, I don't, I have no idea about time. Um, is there um, perhaps five more? Uh, five more minutes? Or yeah. Ten no, okay, but five is perfect. Um, and so what, th the last five minutes I want to do is I said, so this slide here, you actually look, this is a potential that you can come up to, but you don't actually know if people are prepared to shift between cars, if in some households it might be that, oh, but uh, this is my car and this is my wife or my husband's car, I would never sit in it. Uh, or, you know, I always have my stuff in the car, I don't want to shift between them. Uh, so we actually wanted to, to test to see how do households cope with this fact of electric vehicles, how do they do it. And that's why I say why we are now working with replacing. So we had one group, 10, vehicle, 10 households during, during the summer, and we have 10 more households now until January, February. Uh, so we've carried out the first round of interviews and just, these are very tentative results, nothing that I would want to be quoted about because we haven't really done the analysis. But from what we can see is that there is actually no major problem for adaptation. They don't find it as problematic. We've tried to ask, is there any trip you've had to, any time you've both gone in a different direction, any, you know, we've tried to see if there could be anything. And they've mainly answered, no, there's no problem with the range really because we have another car. So we take the other car when we want to go on, on long distance trips. Or one issue that's come up actually, which is interesting is that towing is an important fact to have like this to be able to, the capacity to tow, um, <clears throat> which is also one of the reasons why, for example, when they've chosen which car to replace and things like that. But mainly they, they don't perceive it as problematic 
some say that yes, maybe we've had to plan our trips a little bit more, but it's not been a major issue. But many, so many are quite positive to electric vehicle. They like it. They don't feel that it's a major difference. They, they feel that it fits in quite well. Uh, they are a bit unhappy about the range, but that is because the range is not really like the stated range. It sh goes down quite quickly, so they, they would want to have a little bit more, but it's not been problematic for them anyway. But when it comes to the question if they're willing to buy an electric vehicle, many of them, I say, are very risk averse with that. They're not willing to do the investment of actually buying an electric vehicle, but are willing to lease. And we know for sure that at least one of the families has actually gone in and leased an electric vehicle afterwards. But if you ask them, would you be willing to buy one? They say no, because they, and the main reason for that is the high price and the risk of the battery that it will not have a long lifetime enough and they don't know what they can get on the secondhand market for the vehicle. There's also a tendency, what I call the clean conscience rebound. So it's not so much an economic rebound that the electric vehicle is cheaper to drive, but they actually say that they use the EV a little bit more because, you know, you know it's an electric vehicle. It doesn't, it doesn't feel bad to drive it. So, um, so one couple who had uh, kids with driver's licenses that were still living at home, they were like, yeah, we would probably let our kids drive the electric vehicle more than um, the conventional vehicle because then it's an electric vehicle and it feels okay. So we, otherwise maybe we would have said them take the bus, but now it was okay that they took the electric vehicle. Some others that were in the countryside and they let their kids drive back to Gothenburg um, much more than that they would otherwise do because it's an electric vehicle. So it doesn't pollute. So you, you can see that. We, we haven't been able to quantify it to see anything of it, but it's just from the interviews. As so there, I think, were my extra my five minutes there. This is just to say the other publication, other studies that we are working using the same data sets around it, looking at, uh, again, battery sizes. This is much more on the distribution of daily vehicle driving distances, a more theoretical paper, and this is looking at the brake energy regeneration. So thank you. So I'll just uh, start with a question or two to get this going, and then if you have more questions, feel free to raise your hand. So the um, first thing I thought about was um, your total cost of ownership calculations, what you include and perhaps don't include, because there's a lot of things you could sort of account for a lower service cost, but that insert, uh, that's quite uncertain. And so, so if you want to comment a bit more on that, and also in combination with that, uh, what you can say of the sort of current subsidies for electric vehicles and how they fare against this, uh, the cost level as you have looked at it. So when it comes to total cost of ownership, we have not taken into consideration maintenance and services at all. So we have presumed that that's equal. So it's investments costs and then it's running costs uh, that we have taken into consideration into it. Um, in, the, in the one for Swedish and German uh, data, we have for the Swedish case included the current subsidy for battery, the Supermiljöbilspremien in Swedish. So that's one of the reasons, oh now I have too many things in my hands, but um, so what you see here is if you look at the shares here for Germany, they are very, very low compared to Sweden where Yannick and Gay get around 12% uh, and so on, but here it's, it's like 1%, 2%, so it's much lower for Germany. And, and when we've tried to look, now I don't have my computer, so I don't have the extra slide, but when we try to look at, at what is the effect of uh, subsidy versus the different energy prices, we see that the effect is about the same. So the fact that there are better condition, economic conditions in Sweden is a combination and, and it's about the same effect, both the fact that you have a subsidy and when you start and the fact that the energy prices are different in Sweden. So is that yeah, answers? Yeah, that's yeah. what I was after. Um, anyone who wants to? Yeah. Can you just clarify a little bit about what you mean when you say energy prices? Because there's lots of types of energy. There's like oil, biofuel, and then electricity, and it depends on each country um, where the electricity comes from. 
So when it comes to energy prices, we mainly looked at two, and that's the average electricity price, which the consumer actually pays for, like private households, so average electricity prices for the household. And uh, then we've taken gasoline and diesel prices. So I didn't go into it here, but when we compare, when we look at the vehicle, if it's going to be a battery electric vehicle, then we also have, or if it's going to be a gasoline or a diesel vehicle. So we have gasoline prices and, and uh, diesel prices. Thanks. I have a question on the methodology for the interviews. Um, what was said to the household that were interviewed? Because consumer behavior, normally we don't like to change. Like it's really difficult to change habits. So to what extent they were conscious of the potential benefits of trying out to optimize their their use or was it really like here you have two cars this one is electrical this one is not try to make the most of it and they decide what's the most according to their uh -huh, understanding yeah so we actually also got questions from from the in those that we were both interviewing and giving the vehicles in which they asked, do you want us to drive a certain way or anything like that? So we were quite open with that. We said, no, we want you to drive it as if you would actually have bought the electric vehicle yourself, or as if it was. So we wanted, to, what we told them is that we want them to have as much normal driving as possible. So kind of them putting into the mindset that they've decided to buy an electric vehicle and that how would they use it. So they have not gotten any indications that what we're looking at is how they can optimize it or anything like that. We've said just that we're curious to see how it fits in their daily life. Anyone else? Otherwise I'll chip in one. Uh, and that is, uh, okay, anyone from the from internet, okay. Um. Okay, so from um, Sean Hobbs here. Uh, at what point do you think consumers will become more confident in terms of battery life and resale values? How quickly or slowly do you think this might happen? Oh, a very good question, but also a very hard one to answer. Um, so I think when they, I think when they might start getting confident is when you, after a few years, when you start having some consumer experience from it. So to really create confidence, you probably would need another five to ten years because then you start having electric vehicles, more electric vehicles that have actually been out for a long time, and so consumers can actually see that. Hopefully, if if they actually have a longer lifespan, that that it works. Uh, with hybrid electric vehicles, that's what happened with the Priuses. There was a lot of worry in the beginning that they also would not have a longer battery lifespan, and now you actually see that they are running. They're still running. You have quite a lot of old Priuses still running on the roads today. So I think that's what is needed for it. What might help and facilitate that is to have better. Uh, good battery guarantees and that's also something that you have experiences from the hybrids like in California in which uh, California State went in and prolonged both when it comes to distances, kilometers travel and years uh, for the battery lifespan and I think that might like make that quicker for the consumer. So I have uh, one that might maybe towards summing this up, uh, but more questions are welcome. We have a couple of more minutes, and that is uh, if you take sort of the full uh, picture here from your types of studies and uh, your uh, impressions of battery electric vehicles and plugins, what what is the most important barrier to people uh, overall uh, for for considering buying plugins or, or pure battery electric vehicles? Uh, directly from the research when it comes to at least second car households or like two car households it's actually the price because that comes up most often is that the pri they still are presumed to be too expensive um, and I think that might be at an initial state even more than what ranges because when when the consumers when they get to try it they realize that range is not such a big limit as as it is at least if you have another vehicle that you can shift to so i would if i would single out one it would probably be price could you also qualitatively it's compare uh, rel related to that question could you also qualitatively compare the impact of um 
like the oil market, how right now oil prices are extremely low, how that affects how people want to consume electric vehicles. So it's, it's actually interesting with the low, with decreasing um, oil prices and gasoline prices, if we look at the market today, we actually don't see that much of a dent. And I mean, the electric vehicles continue to increase. And so some say that might, might, there might be other factors behind since uh, people are not always so uh, rational. I mean, we use total cost of ownership in our analysis, but there are not that many that I think maybe always do it. Otherwise, an indication of that can just be, if I can just find going through here, is actually this one here when it look, comes to plug-in hybrids, in which you can say the U.S. compared to Germany and Sweden, one of the big differences there. Um, so when it comes to the economic profitability of these electric vehicles, I mean, the case of the U.S. is much worse. But then on the other hand, the U.S. is one of the markets that has actually, that is selling electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids. So you see that there are other factors that are just as important that are coming in. Yeah, I could comment a bit on that as well, that I think that there is some, at least some indication of, of not as rapidly going sales number in the U.S. now due to the oil price, lower oil prices uh, and then gasoline prices. But here in Europe, we have a large, much larger proportion of tax, etc., that keeps the price up mm -hmm. um, at high levels, even though the raw oil price goes down. So it's, it's a very different picture between different uh, countries and regions. So, any final questions from, from abroad or online or in the room? Otherwise, I think we'll round off. So, thank you everyone, and thanks again, Francis, for presenting, and uh, great to have you here. Okay, thanks. Thank you.